All right, this is the second part of the 7.03 video. We were on the reading about the Dawes Act. Um, in case you finished that, missed that last paragraph, it was, if it was cut out in the video, I'll finish this last paragraph here. Most Indians opposed the Dawes Act, but they had no say in the matter. Between 1887 and 1932, the tribes lost two-thirds of their more than 130 million acres to the government. The Dawes Act mainly benefited white settlers. The native tribes were cleared from the plains, and now no area of the continent was off limits to settlement. And this picture here of the, um, I, I think is a stark a photo representation of how the Dawes Act affected Native Americans. The top photo is of children before they were sent to boarding schools and the bottom after four months of school trying to strip away all their Native American culture, language, um, dress, everything. So cutting their hair, taking different clothes, not allowing them to speak their languages anymore, trying to, as they said, Americanize them. So they would be civilized, which was, of course, just destroying their native cultures and traditions, which is a very sad. From Ghost Dance to Wounded Knee. By 1890, despair gripped the tribes of the Great Plains. Confined to barren land, forced to farm rather than hunt, they felt the old ways of life slipping away. Then word spread about a ritual practiced by the Paiuets of Nevada, Wavuka, a Paiwet shaman, spiritual leader, said that he had a vision of the spirit world which he learned, in which he learned of the coming of a savior who would drive away the whites and restore the Indians to their homelands. To hasten this day of salvation, said Wavuka, the Indians should go through a ritual involving days of meditation and dancing. The Sioux seized upon this ghost dance, as it came to be called, as a last hope. They also made ghost shirts, garments painted with sacred designs. These garments, they were told, would protect them but protect the wearers from bullets of white soldiers. As the ghost hands spread, government agents watched with alarm. Indians are dancing in the snow and are wild and crazy, an official telegraphed army commanders. We need protection and we need it now. As the cavalry regiment rushed to the reservation, the ghost dancers hid in an unmapped corner of the territory. Officials tried to arrest Sitting Bull, who had stayed behind. A skirmish broke out and Sitting Bull was shot dead. Days later, the cavalry found the ghost dancers at Wounded Knee Creek. As the soldiers began to disarm the Indians, a gun went off accidentally. The U.S. troops reacted by opening fire into the camp with machine guns, killing 146 Sioux, among them 44 women and 18 children. That night, snow blanketed the bodies of the fallen Sioux, the final casualties of the 40-year war for control of the West. And here's a picture of a band of Lakota Sioux, all who were killed at Wounded Knee. The West and popular in the popular imagination. As the West began to pass into legend, even before the frontier had reached the Mississippi, Davy Crockett's 1834 autobiography inspired a flood of cheap paperbacks called dime novels filled with outrageous tales of excitement in the wilderness. In the decade before the first prospectors set foot in California, the standard plot of the Western had already involved a rugged white hero, fearless and self-reliant, takes on his enemies, usually Indians, with nothing but the weapon in his belt. Fiction depicts the West as a violent and lawless place. Shootouts on dusty streets, criminals hunted and killed by a lone town sheriff, murderers lynched in vigilante mobs. But Western streets were not nearly as deadly as their reputations imply. The first years in a new settlement, before any municipal organization had evolved, were usually the bloodiest. But every mining camp and cattle town represented someone's investment. If a town became so dangerous that railroad men or ranchers feared to come, or if riots led to the destruction of property, financiers could lose money. As the editor of a Kansas newspaper wrote, Wichita desires law and order with their con conquest and peace and security, and not bloodshed in a name that will cause a thrill of horror wherever, whenever mentioned. Investors encourage residents to develop a system of justice, and mayors appointed police squads. The lone marshal exists only in the movies. A gun duel at high noon in the town square, first imagined by Orson Owen Wister in his 1902 novel, The Virginian, and copied by countless movie directors in the, late, in the mid to late 20th century, was virtually unheard of. Westerns reflected the nation as it wanted to see itself, individualistic, self-reliant, and honorable. Above all, in Western fiction, White America emerged as a conqueror, bringing order to the wilderness, justice to the lawless, and civilization to the Indians. 
The Wild West Show. In the late 19th century, people began to enjoy the new pastimes and entertainments, including extravagant shows that glamorized the Wild West. One of the most popular was Buffalo Bill Cody's Wild West Show, which entertained Eastern audiences with horses, buffalo, sharpshooters, cowboys, and Indians. One of the stars of the show was James Wild Bill Hickok, a legend of the Western frontier. After serving as a spy for the Union in the Civil War, he found work as a marshal in several mining and cattle towns. He was a skilled gunman and imposed a strong armed order on Abilene, Kansas, and Deadwood in the Black Hills. After touring with the Wild West show for a couple of years, Hickok yearned to, re yearned to return to the frontier. In 1876, he was shot dead at a poker match in Deadwood. According to legend, he was holding aces and eights, now known as the dead man's hand. The myth of the Wild West was popular in Europe, as on the eastern seaboard of the U United States. The steamship made it possible for Buffalo Bill to transport his whole show, animals and all, across the Atlantic. Little Sure Shot, Annie Oakley, performed for many European monarchs, including Queen Victoria and Germany's Crown Prince, Crown Prince Wilhelm. At a performance in Berlin, Prince Wilhelm stepped down from the stands and dared Annie Oakley to shoot a cigarette out of his mouth. She hesitated about one second, lifted her rifle, and blew the cigarette away. And here's a, a poster that would advertise the Wild West show with Annie Oakley, Little Miss Sure Shot. The, idyll the idyllic West. Perhaps more than anything else, conquering the West meant conquering the land. But as fields and meadows around the country gave way to railroads and factories, Americans began to idealize the nation's last great preserve of open wilderness. While Americans built towns, cities, and industry in the Rockies and the Plains, artists and writers celebrated the vastness and power of the frontier landscape. One of the most influential was the painter Albert Beerschot, whose family moved to Massachusetts from Germany when he was a child. He took his first trip to the West in 1859, two years after he finished studying painting in Europe. In the frontier, he saw what he called the best material for the artist in the world. His oversized canvases gave many Easterners their first glimpse of the expansive, majestic terrain beyond the Mississippi. In his most famous work, the panoramic 6 by 10 foot The Rocky Mountains, Landers Peak, snow-capped mountains dominated the sky, dwarfing an Indian encampment on the foreground. The painting was exhibited through the United States and Europe in the mid-1860s, and the printed reproduction brought the grandeur of the frontier to homes around the country. And here's the picture of it, which, as you can see, is quite expansive with the mountains in the background, the waterfall, the trees. It is a rather expressive painting. Realistic views of the West. Some American writers offered a realistic view of the West. For example, Samuel Clemens, who published under the pen name Mark Twain, is best known today for The Adventures of Tom Sawyer and The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, but was most famous for his lifetime in his lifetime for travel writing. In 1872, he published Roughing It, the story of a miner trying to strike it rich in the desert southwest. In the book, Mark Twain drew on his experience accompanying his brother to a government post in Nevada. He described how the lure of adventure could be undermined by the reality of experience. This enthusiasm, this stem thirst for adventure, he wrote, wilted under the sultry August sun and did not last above one hour. The poetry was all in the anticipation. There was none in the reality. Another writer, Hamlin Garland, turned his unsentimental eye to the lives of Western, Western farmers in the last decades of the 19th century. While popular fiction presented a romantic picture of prairie farming, happy families, wholesome work, bountiful harvests, Garland and many tra main traveled roads, his most famous short story collection revealed the harshness of life on the plains. The Closing of the Frontier Ever since 1790, government officials have taken a census, a count of the nation's population, as required by the Constitution. Government census reports, issued every 10 years, include a map of the nation's population density. The early map showed a frontier line to separate settled regions from areas with fewer than two persons per square mile. In the map accompanying the 1790 census, the frontier line was not far from the East Coast. Decade by decade, however, the line moved farther west. And 1890, the superintendent of the census announced, at present, the unsettled area has been so broken by bodies of settlement that it can hardly be said to be a frontier line. The American West was so heavily settled that, in effect, the frontier was closed. The closing of the frontier prompted Frederick Jackson Turner, a young historian at the University of Wisconsin, to consider the relationship between the development of the American democracy and the settlement of the West. 
In his 1893 essay, The Significance of the Frontier in American History, Turner put forth his frontier thesis. The existence of the frontier, he asserted, was a key factor in shaping the course of American history. He also argued that the frontier had molded a distinctively democratic American character, practical, energetic, and ruggedly individualistic. And now, Turner concluded, four centuries from the discovery of America, at the end of a hundred years of life under the Constitution, the frontier has gone, and with its going, has closed the first period of American history. What would happen to Americans, Turner worried, with no more frontier to energize and motivate them? Turner's ideas on the shaping power of the frontier provided hugely popular. Many historians have since debated or rejected his thesis and insist on a more complex view of the frontier roles in American history. It was not, these historians argue, simply a matter of wide open spaces aspiring ruggedly democratic individuals to ever greater progress. Rather, the history of the 19th century American West was one of struggle, of fortunes won and lost, and her survival in an often hostile environment. Thousands saw their dreams die in empty mines or parched croplands, and thousands of Native Americans lost their homes or their lives as settlers filled the frontier. In the early 1880s, when Lewis and Clark returned from the explorations of the West, President Thomas Jefferson had predicted that at least 100 generations, roughly 2,000 years, would pass before Americans would settle all the unsettled territory. But the time required to settle the frontier proved considerably less. On February 14, 1912, about 100 years after Lewis and Clark's journey, Arizona, the last unincorporated territory in the West, became the 48th state in the Union. And then here in this last page is Frederick Johnson Jackson Turner's Frontier Thesis. And you can read through this on your own. Um, since we're almost out of the time for this video, I'm going to just keep going on. And the other thing we have to do is complete the reality and myths of the Old West activity. Reality or myth, 20th century popular culture has portrayed the American West in ways that are often far removed from reality. The facts can be found in primary sources. I love primary sources, things that are authentic to the time, that were happened and were written and recorded in the time in which they were produced. The history of the Old West is well documented through diaries, newspaper articles, land sale contracts, records from courtroom proceedings, and other primary source material. Yet novels, television shows, and movies often present the West of a popular imagination. When you finish reading, turn here to complete this activity, Realities and Myths of the Old West. And, you know, actually, since we're almost out of the time for this video, I'm going to stop here and we'll finish this up, the last parts of this lesson, in part three of the video.